All right. Well, welcome to the next session. We're here with Justin Drake, and he's going to be talking about Plonk without FFTs. Please let us know if you can hear us, just in the side chat. Testing, testing. If you can see us, if you can hear us. They seem to be here. Hey, there we go. Very good. OK, so Justin, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to talk about a Planck without FFTs. So basically trying to do Planck um, you know, starting from the Lagrange basis and ending in the Lagrange basis without having to do these, uh, these basis changes. Um, and you know, I'm going to introduce um, some, some, some new ideas, some new techniques, but some, some of the ideas will mean uh, um, that the, um, the construction of, of Planck needs to be uh, changed a little bit. So it's not strictly speaking Planck, but it's more of a Planck-inspired uh, construction. And um, the uh, the goal is to um, to uh, sorry one one of the key themes in this talk is uh, is around ASICs trying to uh, solve address uh, scalability of of circuits um, and uh, you know try and tackle large circuits and and use uh, ASICs to help us. So the the talk can kind of be. Uh, summarized uh, in this in this one slide, where basically uh, we have these FFTs, these fast Fourier transforms, and we want to try and um, trade them off for something else, uh, which I call FLCs, fast linear combinations. Um, so that's maybe not a term you've heard before, but um, basically by linear combination, I just mean multi exponentiation, uh, but you know, I'm kind of trying to use the additive notation, uh, which I think there's there's probably at this point rough consensus that it's it's better than the multiplicative notation. Uh, at least it's clearer. Um, and the the fast here basically uh, is in reference to the the algorithm um, that uh, that we're using. So instead of doing the naive linear combinations, uh, we would use you know fancy Pippinger like algorithms. Uh, that are uh, quite a bit faster. Okay, so I'm going to try and take the FFTs and make them into FLCs. So my talk will have uh, two parts. One will be kind of try and explain why we care so much about removing FFTs, uh, and the other part will be like an actual construction, um, you know, more technical, and I will present the, the key ideas in the second part. So just to give a little bit of context where we are today in SNARKs. Um, I'd argue we're in a, a great present, a position in terms of the verifier. The verifier is super succinct, the proofs are super short, um, you know, super cheap to verify on a CPU or in an EVM even. And we also have uh, universality uh, for, uh, for, for Planck. But the, the big bottleneck to reaching kind of um, mainstream adoption with many more applications is basically prover speed. And we want to try and accelerate the prover for, for many reasons. We want to try and uh, have tackle larger circuits. Um, we want to you know, lower the, the, the proof latency, so basically the time it takes to generate these proofs relative to the, the native computation. And we also want cheaper proofs in terms of, 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 of a dollar cost. And um, you know, we, this, this desire to accelerate provers has uh, kind of materialized more recently where there's a, a big focus on, you know, the actual constants uh, involved in the provers. So breakthroughs such as a uh, lookup um, and, and turbo plonk and, um, you know, actual uh, applications like, like, like loop ring and code that have invested kind of significant engineering in, in speeding up these provers. Okay, and um, you know one of the things that's probably uh, easy to make a prediction about is that we're going to see exponential growth uh, in the in the in the circuits that are being tackled. So, you know, we started with Zcash, which is kind of a a, a baby circuit, and gradually we're, uh, we're we're building up the the size. And so here we're we're roughly in in, in this column where um, you know. 
on the order of two to the uh, 25 gates, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, we're still tiny. And I think there's lots of room uh, to, uh, to grow to, to bigger circuits. And uh, you know, maybe a tentative roadmap here is uh, we could try and grow the circuit size by, uh, by 32x um, every four years, which is, I guess, um, uh, you know, a bit more aggressive than, uh, than Moore's law. Okay, so where are we today in terms of uh, prover time distribution? So we have basically three components in the prover. We have the witness generation, the FFTs, and the, the linear combinations. And where we stand today is that um, the, the witness generation is uh, kind of a, a pretty essential step, which is not super parallelizable, uh, but the good news is that it's, it's quite a small part um, of the prover time. And then we have the FFTs, which are significant, but not the main bottleneck. And then we have the, uh, the linear combinations, which tend to, uh, to, to dominate the, the prover time. So um, one of the things that I'm uh, suggesting that we, we can do is we can trade off the FFTs, which is the uh, yellow part for, the, uh, for, for more uh, linear combinations. And here, in this, in this trade-off, it might seem kind of um, disadvantageous at first because actually you have to do more linear combinations. So um, in, as a result, the witness generation um, becomes only 1% versus 3%, let's say. You have to do three times more in terms of uh, linear combinations. Um, but the good news is that you only have to worry about two things as opposed to three things. Um, and then if you introduce uh, a linear combination ASIC here, then um, and get you know on the order of, of a thousand x uh, speed up, then we can get to a point where actually um, the linear combinations will only take about uh, ten percent of the of the total uh, proof time, and really will be in, in the position where the the witness generation uh, dominates, and and this is kind of where we're in the position we want to be and. And once we're there, I, I expect uh, we'll find all sorts of, of clever tricks to, to speed up the, the witness generation, which hasn't been a, a focus of today's uh, optimizations. So you know, one natural question to ask is, um, you know, are FFTs so bad? Can't we just have uh, two ASICs if you want to tackle very large circuits? Uh, one, one ASIC that does the linear combinations and one ASIC that does the FFTs. And one kind of immediate argument of the bat is that if we go with you know one ASIC as opposed to two ASIC, the, the ASIC cost and complexity just goes down by roughly a factor of two, um, maybe more because you have you have more moving parts where you have to transfer the data between. So a very significant simplification, um, you know, which is on the order of uh, five million dollars also in terms of savings. And also because we're, we're, you know, we're simplifying the, the R&D, we, <clears throat> we can deploy with, with just a linear combination ASIC um, and, and get results uh, immediately, uh, well, get, get results um, kind of sooner into the market um, and kind of have a, a more gradual timeline where we introduce uh, FFT ASICs um, maybe down the road. So, you know, one opportunity maybe to introduce them would be, let's say, in 2030 when, when we need them for, for quantum security because um, as far as, uh, as I know, all the quantum secure um, SNARK schemes uh, uh, require um, FFT. As a <clears throat> I mean, if, if you watch um, Ellie's talk, he might give you some intuition as to why, why, why this is required. Um, and the other thing is, um, Around cost, and this is maybe one of the the, the, the bigger ar arguments for trying to remove um, FFTs is that basically, um, as, as we'll see as we'll see in, in the next slide, um, for the types of circuits that we'd be looking at, you know, on the order of, of one billion gates and, and above, and the type type of hardware that we have, which is namely ASICs, if we were to design uh, both both FFT and 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 FLC um, ASICs would be in a position where ninety percent of our 
of our system of the hardware is dedicated to FFTs. So basically, FFTs start becoming the bottleneck. So it's the opposite situation to what we have today. Um, and so we can have um, kind of the same performance at 10x less uh, cost if we remove FFTs. So um, this is the um, kind of the, the relative cost, uh, very roughly speaking, of FFTs <clears throat> versus FLCs. So <clears throat> if you focused on CPUs, which is this, this, um, this first row, well, you'll see that you know, on, on CPUs, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the, the FFTs and the FLCs um, are on, on, on the same order of magnitude. You know, one is not 10, 10 times less than the other or vice versa. Whereas if you move uh, to, to ASICs, then suddenly, you know, if you look at uh, uh, in the ASIC world with a billion gates, then the, the, the FFTs is, will, will cost 10x the work relative to the FLCs. So let me try and, and justify this, this table a little bit. So the first thing that's maybe worth noting is that as the size of the, the circuit grows, um, basically FFTs have a, a, a natural tendency to start dominating over the linear combinations. And the reason is that there's this log squared divergence where there's a log factor that comes from the overhead in the FFTs, and there's another log factor that comes from, uh, from Pippinger. It is basically the speed up of Pippinger and the linear combinations. And so you see, as I'm growing the, the circuit size here, um, the, the relative proportion of the FFTs versus the FLCs starts growing. <clears throat> and the, the other consideration is that um, CPUs today are, are already pretty good in relative terms at doing the, the, the linear combinations, so the, the FFTs. And the reason is that the, the operations are over these, these, these fields as opposed to being group operations. So the arithmetic, the arithmetic that you have to do is, is 256 bits, um, which, which CPUs are actually fairly uh, well optimized to, 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 to do. And it's like plain, um, uh, fairly simple you know, and, and straightforward, uh, you know, uh, modular uh, additions and, and multiplications. But when, when you work um, with, with linear combinations, you have to, you have to do these, these group operations, um, which involves, uh, you know, uh, for example, if you work with BLS381, you have to do these 381 bit um, uh, arithmetic, and you have to, do, there's many more moving parts in a single operation. So there's more opportunity for ASICs to speed things up in, in, in the linear combinations relative to the FFTs. And also, as we'll see, there's, <clears throat> there's a, a much more favorable um, parallelism story uh, for uh, linear combinations versus FFTs. So um, <clears throat> roughly speaking, we're looking at a, 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 a 10x, um, 10x more speed up for the linear combinations uh, versus the FFTs if we were to go um, for, for A6. Okay, so just to quickly go over this parallelism point. So, you know, the so parallelism is kind of a spectrum. There's things that you can't parallelize at all, at all like, like the VDFs, which people would say are inherently sequential. And then you have things like, like SHA-256 proof of work, which are embarrassingly parallel. And like the, the work for SNARKs kind of falls uh, in between the spectrum. So we have the, the witness generation, which is the, the least parallelizable, but the good news is that it's not, it's not the amount of computation is not too bad. Um, we have the, the FFTs, which are uh, kind of in between here, where you have to, to do these, these, these memory shuffles and um, things can be parallelized, but um, there's, there's stuff moving around. And then you have these linear combinations, which are you know, extremely parallelizable, not quite as parallelizable, as SHA-256 because you have to, um, you know, if you if you use Pippinger, then, then there's some constraints on parallelizability, but it's, it's, it's much more straightforward to parallelize linear combinations than it is to parallelize Fourier transforms. Um, and 
just to 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 give a little bit of flavor of the parallelism in FFTs, um, probably the, the most appropriate project here is is DISIC, um, distributed uh, zero knowledge, and they you know they they try to you know parallelize the the, the computation of FFTs over very large circuits, um, and one of the things they did is they tried to minimize the number of of these memory shuffles. So they used a, a, a kind of a, an algorithm called Z's algorithm. But one of the things um, that you know that that we found basically are looking at these graphs is that you, you have to pay <clears throat> uh, you have to pay a constant factor, which is not super favorable um, to, to 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 have to benefit from this um, parallelism. Okay, uh, and this is kind of my final slide on the motivation, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty of the, the the construction. So, if you remove FFTs, you can you can start dealing with with larger circuits. So you have more scalability, um, and you have this ASIC strategy where you can uh, focus on the linear combinations and not so much on the FFTs. And the other final advantage that I wanted to highlight is that um, you can go beyond the two addicity limit um, that 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 the curves have. So for example, um, BLS 12381, I think, has a two adicity of, of uh, 32. And so, you know, the, you, generally you, you want to choose your two adicity to, to, to be a lot larger than, than the size of your circuit so that you can do these, these, these FFTs efficiently. The good news is that in, in these constructions, you, you don't need a two adicity to be, to be that high. Um, and, if we go back kind of to the, the one key idea behind this, this no FFTs idea is, is actually <clears throat> um, the root idea is a, a no divisions idea. So you want to try and do snarks without any divisions. And in addition to having no FFTs, you have two other kind of consequences if you do a little bit more work. One is that you can, uh, you can have snarks which are um, sparse circuit friendly. So if, if you have a, a circuit with with lots of zeros, then uh, you can significantly accelerate the prover, and you can also have uh, binary circuit uh, uh, friendly provers. So in terms of applications here, if we have lots of branching in the circuit, something which is uh, you know traditionally known as being very expensive, then you can start thinking of of doing branching um, cheaply, and you can also start of thinking of doing um, try and and do uh, ZK VMs, uh, basically trying to to do <clears throat> a VM inside the snark where you you might be calling one operation at a time, and then the rest of the circuit is all zeros. Um, you, you could look at ex at, at accelerations there, um, and also for the uh, for binary circuits like like SHA two fifty six, um, you know. One one way to accelerate things is is the 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 plug up um, idea from Aztec, but here um, you have like a, a, a more more generic potentially like more generic approach to handling binary circuits um, that that just works for for all binary circuits, and but this will be uh, for for a future talk. Okay, I'll just check if there's any questions so far. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, there's um, a bunch of questions from Vitalik. Uh, can't you argue that? Oop, can't you argue that FFT A6 are going to be developed anyway because there will be people that want to use Fry? Yes, uh, yes, I agree. Um, Fry seems to seems like a general purpose enough ingredient that we can count on them existing soon enough. Yes, um, I would agree, um, and you know maybe Starkware will be the one uh, you know pushing forward these FFT A6. I think Starkware's model right now is that um, they want to um, kind of uh, make a business model out of proving, and so proving would be done by them uh, potentially. And I think as a company, they can. Uh, you know they can afford to own you know to rent out you know data centers. So one one way to scale out is just to go on AWS and and just get as many computers as you can. And you know that that is definitely one way to parallelize. 
But if you want to be in the, you know, if you want to take a different approach, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, around around provers where you 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 want any, anyone in the world with with a, a reasonable amount of hardware to participate, um, then you know, then the in incentives of of Starkware, um, well, you need some sort of different uh, different type of in incentives. Um, so Nick is asking, what is the dependence on the security parameter for FFT versus FLC? Um, so I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but um, there's, you, you don't have to play around with security parameters. So there's, as far as I can tell, the, 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 the construction that we'll present now basically that doesn't change the, the security parameters. It just keeps everything the same in terms of security parameters. It just removes the FFTs completely, and then it it, it adds um, it adds basically more linear combinations as a trade-off. And then we have a question from Alan, which says, "Can the FFT be represented as linear combinations? If so, why can't FFT benefit from Pippage's algorithm?" Um, yeah, I don't know how to represent uh, FFTs as linear combinations. You know, as far as I can tell, the best algorithm to do FFTs is as n log n. And if you could, you know, use Pippinger to accelerate FFTs, that would be that would be a great breakthrough. But I, I don't know of of any such things. Okay, so let's go into the construction. So the starting point is the Planck equations, um, and you know, it, it looks intimidating because we have all these signals. But let's try and and dissect what's going on here. So we have the various polynomials, each of degree um, at, at most n. So they're um, polynomials in, in the Lagrange basis. And there's a few basic operations that you're doing on these polynomials. So basically, by the way, these equations should be equal zero. So there's four equations, and each one should be equal to zero mod modulo the vanishing polynomial on the roots of unity. So what are you doing here? You, you have some, some multiplications. So you're multiplying two polynomials, and you have um, additions. So these are two very important uh, operations that you're doing on, on polynomials. And then another kind of interesting thing uh, to, to note is that you want to do shifts um, in the, uh, so basically you want to shift with wraparound um, all the coefficients. You, if you think of, of the, the roots of unity as being a circle and the evaluations lying on that circle, you kind of want to rotate the circle. Um, and the final thing that you, you, know, you want to do as well is you want to be, the prover wants to commit to the, the wire polynomials. So there's two types of polynomials. There's the pre-processed ones and the non-pre-processed ones. The pre-processed ones are already committed to, so there's, there's no prover work there. Uh, but the the ones that need committing, actually, you actually need to do the commitments. And so um, there's various FFTs hidden in these operations. And I'm going to try and convince you that you can do all these operations without any FFTs. So let's look at commitments first. The key idea here is what I call the Lagrange SRS. So um, when you're given uh, an SRS, the structured reference string, usually you're given the powers of tau. But instead of using the powers of tau, which is not Lagrange friendly, it's kind of in the monomial basis. What if we were to pre-compute ahead of time, um, kind of trustlessly, the, the SRS and the Lagrange basis? And if we were to do this and we were given these, these points uh, as a prover, um, then it would be kind of trivial to compute the, the commitment of the polynomial f as a linear combination. Basically, you just do uh, like an immediate linear combination of, of, of size n, which does not re require an FFT. I mean, one question that comes to mind is like, I'm given the, the powers of tau, is there an efficient way to compute the SRS in the Lagrange basis? And it turns out there is. Um, what you do is you consider this polynomial f, um, which has basically as coefficients the powers of tau. And then if you evaluate this polynomial f on the roots of unity, you know, it's, you, you get as an output on the evaluations, the, the Lagrange SRS. And so basically there is an FFT there, 
uh, but it's a it's a pre-processed FFT. Um, so you have to to pay n log n group operations to to get this this SRS, but it's a one-time thing, and then you you cache this uh, as a prover. So that allows you to do uh, commitments without any FFTs. The next thing we want to do is additions. So we have three polynomials a, b, and c, and the prover has given commitments to these polynomials to the verifier. And the, the, the verifier basically wants to be convinced that A plus B is equal to C as polynomials. Um, so this would be addition, uh, pointwise addition of the, of the coefficients in, in the Lagrange basis. And you know, CAT A has this kind of this superpower, um, which is called linear homomorphisms. Um, and so you just need to check that the commitment of A plus the commitment of B equals the commitment of C. And you know, this will convince you that A plus B um, is, is equal to C. OK. OK, we need to do shifts now. So if you have um, two polynomials, A and B, um, and the, the, you know, the prover has given commitments to the verifier of A and B, the, the, the verifier wants to be convinced that, that A and B are kind of related in this shift way. Well, there's a very standard technique, which is just evaluate at a random point. So the, 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 the verifier will send a random evaluation point uh, to the prover. And uh, you can just check this identity on the random evaluation point. Um, and so that, that asks, the, the question then becomes, how do you do evaluations without FFTs? Um, and how do you do openings uh, without FFTs? So evaluations is, um, can be done with, uh, using the barycentric formula. So you kind of have this, this formula um, which tells you how uh, to evaluate F at any point given the evaluations here in, in the Lagrange basis. And it's, it's a linear sum here. So you can, you know, this is a, this is a, this is not even a linear combination in, in the group. This is just a, a field linear combination. Um, and for the opening proof, you kind of want to, <clears throat> you want to compute the commitment of f of x minus f of z divided by x minus z. And, and this is what uh, uh, this part is here. And again, you use the same trick of the pre-computed uh, Lagrange SRS. So this is just a, an, an FLC, a fast linear combination, uh, again, without FFTs. Now, there is a question of, you know, around divisions here. You have to divide by omega to the power i minus z. It turns out that you can do batch operations. I'm not going to, I don't have much time, so I'll go fast. But it turns out that you can, the inversions are not very costly, um, even, even in the field. OK, so this is kind of, so, so far, notice that there's been like zero changes to Planck. Um, the only thing that I've, I've been telling you about is like implementation details. Like if you want to do evaluations, use a, the, the barycentric formula. If you want to do this, use that. But here I'm, it's kind of the, the hard part of remo re removing FFTs. And here I need to modify Planck uh, a little bit. So let's, let's like focus on the problem statement here. So I have three polynomials, A times B um, equals X, A, B, and X, each of uh, degree N. And I want to show that on the roots of unity, um, they like pointwise a times b is equal to x. So h is going to be the root of unity, and, and z of h is going to be your, your vanishing polynomial. OK, so what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to use the Fry decomposition. So what, is, what does Fry uh, give us? It allows it to take a polynomial f of degree n and split it into its even and odd parts. Um, and one of the really cool properties is that the, the even and odd parts have half the degree of f. And then kind of naturally defined on a domain which is itself um, half the domain of f. So if f is defined on n roots of unity, f of e and uh, f o are, are naturally defined on on the subgroup, the well, on, on a subgroup of size of size half. And that's because of the x squared here versus the x here. 
So we, this is the decomposition that we're going to use. And the key idea is that you know, we, as in Fry, we want to do a logarithmic number of rounds where every round we have a, a, a Hadamard check of size n, and we want to we want to convert that into a Hadamard check of size n over two, and then n over four, and n over eight, until we get to a point where either we go all the way where we have a constant polynomial, or we we kind of abort halfway through, or something like that. And the FFT is so small that it, 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 it's negligible. OK, so this is kind of the, the, key, uh, the key theorem, or the key lemma, I guess. Um, so if you have a Hadamard check of the form a times b equals c plus d, so if I've taken the x above, and I've just for convenience of, of presenting the theorem, I've, I've split it into two parts, the c and the d. Um, and I have kind of this dual check, A times B bar, where B bar is basically the, the rotation of B 180 degrees. So you, if you, this minus sign will basically flip the roots of unity, which is equivalent to uh, 180 degree rotation. If I have this, 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 uh, these two Hadamard checks on H, the roots of unity, then this is equivalent to this, the same kind of um, it, like uh, statement where every, everything everything in the statement is basically half the degree. So the a prime, b prime, c prime, and d prime has each have half the degree of a, b, and c, and the domain has half half the size. Um, and like the reason why we have this cross product. Um, so this, this dual check is so that we handle cross products. Um, and, and this is the definition of A prime, B prime, and C prime. So basically, um, we do the, you know, the typical thing with Fry where we, we, we decompose into two parts and then we reassemble them using verifier randomness. So the, the R here is verifier randomness um, and we, we, we get something which is half the degree. Okay, so I, I think I'm... Uh, almost out of time, so I'm just going to focus on on giving a little bit of intuition behind this proof, and then I'll I'll just stop there. So here's here's some of the the intuition behind the proof of this of this of this fact, which allows us to basically remove the FFTs. So we have these um, polynomials, which I'll represent as as circles, basically. The, the circle is the root of unity, and you have the Lagrange basis, so you have evaluations on, on the circles, and you have the green, the blue, and the red polynomial. It turns out that circles in Google Slides is difficult, so I'm just going to use lines. I'm going to flatten the circles. And then I use the Fry decomposition, where I decompose each polynomial into two pieces. Here, instead of using the even and odd decomposition, I'll use the left and right decomposition. So left, right, left, right, left, right. This, this equation here can be written as two equations. Left times left equals left, and right times right equals right. And then I want to do the reassembly using uh, verifier randomness. So here I've actually denoted the randomness alpha. So I'm, you know, I'm going to try and, and reduce these two equations into a single equation. So I'm going to have left plus alpha right here for the green, left plus alpha right for the blue, and, and here I'm going to do the same thing here, left plus alpha squared right. So basically you see that this red left corresponds to the green left times the blue left, and then this alpha squared right corresponds to alpha right um, for the green plus times alpha right for the blue, but there's these missing cross product terms. Okay, so like the what we're going to do is this is the reason why I want to consider pairs of Hadamard checks as opposed to single Hadamard checks is we kind of want to consider the, the dual check where we take the exact same thing but we rotate B 180 degrees and when we rotate B we're kind of flipping the left and the right. Left and right become flipped. Um, so here on the on the blue part the left and right become flipped. Everything become flipped, and now we kind of have the the red you know polynomial replaced by a, a green polynomial, and so these these cross product terms 
can be fed back in um, to the original equation. And you can do the, the same thing here. So basically this is a showing in, in kind of a diagram, in, in, in diagrams, how we can go from um, Hadamard checks of degree n to Hadamard checks of degree n over two by doing this fry decomposition and then folding everything back in to uh, a single Hadamard check taking, taking care um, of, the, of the cross product terms. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, I'm, I am out of time, so I will stop. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, this is kind of a summary where, um, you know, there's these operations that CATIC uh, commitments need to do, which is uh, commitments, openings, and evaluations. And there's some, you know, two key ideas here, the Lagrange SRS and the barycentric formula. So you can do CATIC without FFTs, no problem. And then if you want to do Planck without FFTs, then you, you kind of need this, this Fry decomposition idea um, and you need to avoid these, these divisions. And there's a few optimizations uh, which I'll skip. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Justin, one thing is you can actually stay in this room if you want to. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on to the next session and I'm going to pull everybody into that session with me. But if anyone wants to remain, you can actually go back up to the schedule and come back to this session, Justin, if you want to keep going. Okay, if yeah, you had more good. material. I know there was a few questions. So I'm going to go to the next one. We'll see you there. And if people want to pop back, then Justin, you can stick around for a little bit. Cool. Sounds good. All right. See you soon. Thank you. So one of the questions uh, which was asked is what goes wrong uh, when you use the left right decomposition rather than even odd? And um, I actually think that you can make it work with the, the left right uh, decomposition. Um, one of the things which is, which is possible that is, um, it's possible that it's basically less efficient. Um, and the reason is that um, if you if you go to the um, if you go to the you know to the left right uh, stuff here you basically sorry if you go to if you look at the Friday decomposition um, you you need to 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 show that the um, basically you need to do some sort of consistency check where you want to show that the even part and the odd part really do correspond uh, to the polynomial that you started with. And so to do that, you, you, you need to evaluate polynomials at a point Z and at a point minus Z and at a point Z squared. So you basically have Z minus Z and Z squared. And it, it turns out there's these nice you know, batching uh, things where you, you can batch the openings of, of many polynomials uh, you know, at the at, at, at these points. Um, but if you were to use uh, the, the, the left-right decomposition, I think that you would need to um, basically evaluate at more points than just these three. You would need to evaluate at possibly uh, z squared, z to the power of four, z, oh no, maybe it would be more like um, w um, times z and then w squared times z w uh, to the power of four times z. So basically you need to do these, um, these shifts uh, when you construct the, the left and, and, and right and these, these, sh these shifts will mean evaluations at more points. So slightly less um, you know, optimal uh, construction if you, you use left and right.
Okay, one question from Kev is, are there any efficiency prover time and proof size comparisons between the original Planck and this modified version? Okay, great question, yes. So one of the trade-offs is that instead of having a constant size proof, you have a logarithmically size proof because you have these, uh, these logarithmic nouns of interaction and each interaction will, will cost you at least one group element. Um, so, you know, you go from a proof size, which is maybe, uh, you know, half a kilobyte to, you know, se several kilobytes, let's say. In the, in the re if you try and really optimize everything, then, you know, maybe, you know, three, four, five kilobytes. Um, the good news is that the, you, o you only have to pay, in terms of computational cost, you only have to pay uh, the, the same amount of pairings. So only two pairings in the modified scheme. And the reason is that you can batch everything. All the pairing operations can be batched. Um, the other thing that you need to consider is the, the number of G1 uh, linear combinations or multi exponentiations for the prover. Um, here, it, the number of uh, G1 exponentiations is going to, uh, to grow. It's gonna maybe you know, triple, uh, but because the, the exponentiations are quite a bit cheaper than the, uh, than the pairings. My back of the envelope calculation is that um, actually the, the, the cost for the verifier is only gonna be something like two or three X than the normal Planck. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're measuring, for example, in terms of gas usage on the, on the EVM, um, this, this, FFT, this Planck without FFTs will only be something like two or three times uh, more expensive to, to verify. Um, so yeah, even though the, the increase in proof size sounds scary, um, I actually don't think this is a problem in practice. Um, and the reason is that, you know, the cost that you pay per byte to go on the EVM is tiny. And this is a reflection of real world realities. You know, the fact that bandwidth is so cheap um, so oftentimes, if your proof size is, is three kilobytes, it's not, you know, bringing it down to, well, it's not significantly worse than, 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 than half a kilobyte. The, the real killer uh, in, these, in these snarks is the, is the pairings, um, which stays constant. And, and then the, the, the next killer is going to be your, your G1 experimentations. But uh, these are still very much under control. And, um, and it, it only increases the computational cost by, by two or three. Okay, uh, Nick uh, asked a related question. Does this modification yield an asymptotic improvement in proving time? Okay, great question. <laughs> and the reason it's a great question is because um, there's different people uh, have different views on asymptotics. So you have the uh, complexity theorists like yourself, Nick, and then you have the um, kind of the engineers, uh, you know, more like uh, like like Zach. And if you if you um, and, and so basically the the complexity of the whole scheme is basically going to be basically dictated by the complexity of taking these linear combinations with Pippinger. And if you um, if you ask a complexity theorist, he'll tell you that the the complexity of Pippinger is actually, um, uh, you know, like super linear. Um, it, it's not it, it, it's, it's, it's not sublinear. Whereas, whereas uh, an engineer will tell you that it it it, it, it it's sublinear. Um, so um, the I guess the the answer is 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 yes. It does it does yield uh, an improvement. So you're basically going from the FFT, which is n log n, down to the complexity of, 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 of Pippinger. Pippinger is going to be, uh, if I believe, is going to be something like um, n lambda divided by log n lambda. And I think that's slightly, well, it's, it's, it's super linear, um, uh, but it, 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 it's a little less than... Uh, uh, than than uh, than FFTs, uh, but if 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 you take a, a pragmatic standpoint and you say, okay, we have this this um, this lambda term which is fixed, let's say to 128 bits, um, and you 
and then you, you consider Pippinger to actually be n divided by log n, then actually the, the, the bottleneck now from a computational standpoint is, um, is, is the, the witness generation, uh, which, which is linear. So, um, you know, just, just reading out the wire values, just basic things like that, the, these linear bottlenecks, which are fundamental, uh, are, are, are the bottlenecks. So, yeah, if, if, if you want to take a more pragmatic standpoint, then this, this, this scheme is, is basically a linear time uh, prover. Okay, one question from Kev is, when would this protocol be more favorable compared to this, to the original Planck? So, so there's going to be two factors here to consider. Uh, factor, maybe three even. Factor number one is what kind of hardware do you use? Until you use, if you use CPUs, then this scheme is, is, is not helpful to you. Um, unless your circuit sizes are enormous, which if there are enormous, then CPUs will, you know, just won't work. Like, you know, your proving time will be days or, or months and it's not practical. So if you're using CPUs, there's no advantage um, whatsoever. If you use um, ASICs, then the advantage are, are very clear, as I hoped I, I explained in the talk. Um, the... And the, the reason is that ASICs are, are ridiculously good at doing linear combinations. And so, you know, the, the next bottleneck will become FFTs. And, and unless you're ready to do two things, one is invest in, a, in an FFT ASIC, and two is to have lots of these FFTs ASIC to compensate for the computational bottleneck relative to the linear combinations. Um, then, then you probably want to go with this scheme. One of the things that I don't know about is is somewhere in between. Like, if you use if you accelerate your linear combinations with with GPUs, um, then then you know it, it's unclear. Um, you know, we need to look at the concrete numbers um, of you know what is the performance of of linear combinations versus FFTs on, on, on GPUs. But as a my general rule of thumb is that as we move forward in the maturation process of this industry, um, we're gonna have circuits of sizes, you know, billions of gates. And, and you know, at that point, when you reach the billion gate level, uh, then this seems like, it seems to be a very clear win. Um, but of course, you know, it will, take, it will take several years until we can mature to this point. Uh, you know, one of the reasons being that we probably want some some form of, of hardware acceleration to get to a, a billion gates. Okay, that's all the questions. Um, thanks everyone.